<laughs> Nick's the president of the Burlington Club, has got his own school, which he's going to tell us about. He's a pretty accomplished turner, there's no question. Um, and I, um, I, without ado, I'd like, without further ado, let's have Nick uh, step in and he's going to demonstrate for us uh, the chess pieces. And if we can, we might do some hands on. All right. Uh, I'm very, I'm not accustomed to wearing microphones. I just usually talk really loud at our meetings. <laughs> uh, so you guys are quite more technologically advanced than we are. Um, but yeah, I'm the president of the Woodchuck Woodturners in Northern Vermont. Uh, we meet once a month on, on Wednesdays, uh, the third Wednesday of every month. I would totally offer if anybody's up that way, uh, to attend, we meet for two hours. It's very similar format, you know. We have a show and tell. Uh, we have a raffle. In fact, folks bring in wood or tools. Two dollars gets you a ticket, and then those funds help uh, support our organization and such. Um, I've been turning for about ten years. Started in two thousand seven. Uh, just took a class. With some random dude got hooked. Uh, then I just kind of started making more stuff. Found a couple local galleries, you know, lost my 50%, as everybody was talking about before. Uh, you just kind of swallow that sometimes. Um, and then I uh, studied for a little while at the Vermont Woodworking School at Cambridge. And then I opened up my own shop um, in Essex, and I sort of bounced around a fair amount. I pretty much do wood turning uh, exclusively, and I do some other work on the side as well, mill work, and I do some maple sugaring, and I have some other fun, that, other things I get my hands dirty with. But uh, much of my work um, that I sell is, are salad bowls, uh, a lot of functional salad bowls. I have a really nice market that I attend on Burlington, the farmer's market there, uh, for six months every Saturday. It's like my only day of work that I really feel is work. Uh, the other days I'm turning, right? That, that's not work. So um, that's pretty much what I do most of the year is uh, sell my work there. And then um, every now and again, I do something really bizarre and crazy, just kind of find an interesting project to endeavor. I do some hollow turning. I do some um, spindle turning. I, lately, I've been trying to get more into architectural turning, which is really entertaining. Uh, porch columns, uh, stair balusters, newel posts, these sorts of things. Getting a little bigger, a little spindle turning. Um, which is really entertaining for me uh, as a craftsman. I kind of like that that part of it. Um, and I also like chess. I really enjoy playing chess. I always have my whole life. So this demonstration is just kind of like the, how I go about um, my process of carving the pieces, I know. And uh, a little bit about design as well. Um, I'll talk about that, how I think about creatively when you design a chess set because, you know, we want a nice pretty chess set uh, and there's certain factors that I kind of consider when I'm doing that. Um, the piece that I make today is not uh, gonna be a part of a set. I'm just gonna kind of walk through the stages, uh, assuming such that one, if anyone here were to make their own chess set, uh, you, you would design it your own style or mimic a, another one that you are familiar with. But this procedure that I'm about to show um, is a good approach to hold the wood on the lathe comfortably, be able to um, use just rough lumber, um, and you can even finish it right on the lathe, uh, sand it, finish it. I'm not going to do the sanding uh, and the finishing here. I just particularly don't like using sandpaper in an audience because it kind of spreads. So I'll get to the cutting, and I think most folks, I'll discuss the sanding, but um, if you don't know how to use sandpaper, I don't know. Maybe you're really good. <laughs> I, um, but um, I... Uh, just a quick show of hands because I, I like to get a little feel for the audience and know what kind of information I should uh, kind of focus on. But um, how many folks do spindle turn? Uh, rolling pins? Has anybody made a chess set? Anything like that? Anybody do balusters or any of that type of stuff? We got one dude raised his hand like three times already. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Uh, spindle turning is, uh, you know, it, it's very different than bowl turning. The grain of the wood is very differently outlaid on the machine. Um, it's very different than hollow turning. Um, Using a whole bunch of different tools. Um, 
I'm not going to sing if you were trying to cue me for that. <laughs> um, so spindle turning, you know, you, you have a different set of tools. My set of tools I keep very basic, very simple. I, I'm not really a tool nut. I kind of like to have two or three tools. If I can't make it with two or three tools, then I'm, I'm not really curious to, to take that endeavor. I don't really make a lot of hand tools. I know a lot of folks, and I like to see people get creative with some of the tooling that they do, making homemade tools and stuff or whatever. I have a spindle gouge, bowl gouge, roughing gouge. Um, I'll show you that in a second. But um, All right, so to start, I, my chest set is over there. Maybe I can somehow set it up here just to kind of get you an image of, of it. Also, I, I brought these other long spindly things out. Maybe I'll talk about it a little later. I should have brought them up at the, uh, during the uh, other conversation on that hold there. So this is, um, this is a chess set that I made. I made the board, make sure you're balanced, and the pieces. Um, I, uh, the board, I'm not gonna really discuss too much about how to make a chess board. It's not really wood turning, but um, I, I had this concept in my mind that I wanted to sort of deconstruct the chess set, if you will, sort of make it uh, space. I like to play with space as a medium because we think about wood, we're thinking about a solid thing, but wood, sometimes if you just break it apart. So I made, if you get a closer look, if you hadn't already, um, you'll see all the squares. There's about a uh, quarter inch gap between all the squares just to kind of blow it apart a little bit. And I have little runners underneath to hold them together. And these sides pinch the whole unit uh, tight. And I, I'm trying to minimize the representation of the board, so to speak, with this approach. And this is one of my first generation of this, this style of chessboard. I call them a floating chessboard. The idea is when you're sort of stepping back, it seems elevated a little bit. It has a nice aesthetic to it. It's really fun to play with. Um, very hard to glue up, however. Um, it was a real pain in the butt. And then I had to finish it. I had to get inside all those little squares. My fingers are too big. Um, and I have, uh, it's made out of walnut and maple. And that's the two woods that I have here to show you. Uh, uh, walnut and maple. Uh, the maple set uh, was made out of kiln dried maple. I purchased eight quarter stock uh, to, to design these pieces. These are one of my, probably my, my fourth set that I designed a few years back. Um, and there's one construction that I'll discuss about how I approach this style. And then these, these walnut ones, I actually started with a tree. I milled the material chainsaw and a bandsaw into basically two inch billets, if you will. Uh, and then I waxed the ends of those and I uh, let it sit on my shelf for a good year and a half, two years. Just forget about it. It's very painful to look at walnut as it sits there drying. Um, and that was a different approach and I'll, and I designed these ones a little bit differently and I'll kind of explain that in a second as well. But, um, working with the material, you want your grain, your wood grain going horizontal, right? Going for, you don't want to go cross grain when you're designing your chest pieces with spindles or anything. So, um, let me think here. I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about my design, how I approach creating the, the dimensions of every piece. And then I'll kind of transition to how I then hold the wood on the lathe. And then I'll do a little bit of demonstration about how I carve, all right? And then you'll kind of get that understanding and see that. First, um, and I'll also be talking a little bit about duplication. There was some consideration about that because you have to make theory you know eight ponds that look alike trust me they don't look alike if you get out your, your micrometer I'm not that careful I'm in a hurry uh, to some degree but all right so I'm just going to show you you got eight pieces right one two three four five six running running short seven uh, let me see here if I had a Six, seven, eight pieces, okay? Now your pawns are all gonna be the same height, all right? Typically what I'll do, if I'm making a board, um, if I'm making a set to match a board, I'll measure the squares here to make sure that the pieces are gonna fit on there. You don't wanna make pieces too big for your board. So I take a measurement, let's say it's two inch squares. Then I'll take 
my block of wood and I'll tell myself that my design is going to be a little less than two inches, probably let's say an inch and seven eighths or even an inch and three quarters. So you would measure this would be, you know, an inch and, uh, I'm not, I'm really bad at drawing stuff. Inch and three quarters square. My pond would then be a cube. That's an inch and three quarters because I like my ponds to be sort of square. Or if I want to extend it a little bit, does anybody know the, um, I think it's called the, the golden rule? Anybody's familiar with that? It's very simple. Yeah, golden mean. Is that uh, when you measure across from corner to corner? Is that, is that, am I on the right path? And then this, this distance, you trace it up a little bit and you get a new, a new length. Is that the golden mean? That's the. Uh, it would get close. <laughs> it would get close. I'm not as articulate as some, I will say that. It's, it's careful. Um, and that would be a proportion that is visually appealing. From what, and you can use that as a quick little way to kind of design your pieces. So my pawn would be my shortest. Then I would consider my rook. Does everybody understand chest and pieces and so forth? Yeah, okay. So the rook is a little, I like it to be a little taller. So you might then again take this corner angle from your, your next height, measure that, it would come up a little further. And you can then stretch it out there, take that measurement and come up and over. And then you get a little another height. And that adds a little bit of aesthetic uh, balance to your chessboard, or pieces rather. And I would continue this pattern of measuring from corner to corner, that distance, and then I would stretch it up vertically and come across. Repeat that. And then in, in you find a certain aesthetic. If we were to spin this around, you'll notice that the pieces, they go, kind of go up and then they come down. And that's sort of a, you could play with that. I like to play with that when I'm designing my set. Again, I'm not particularly articulate. I, I tend not to be too sharp. So it's not ideal, but if one wanted to consider that as an approach to kind of coming up with the size of your piece, that's sort of the, the, the simple way uh, to do so. If anybody know Mike Darlow? Anybody heard of that name? He's, he's a, he does a lot of book writing and stuff. Beautiful book on chess, sets, uh, pieces. He goes back to a lot of our, our archaic pieces and they're made of stone and so forth. If you're looking into chess pieces, now you should definitely buy that book, Mike Darlow, in his series. Um, and he talks about some of the aesthetics of the heights and sort of things and sort of familiarities with designing a piece, right? This is all sorts of styles. The Turkish styles of chess pieces are really ornate. Um, if I had a Turkish set in front of me, I couldn't tell you which one was what. But uh, a lot of what we think about as a chess set refers to a style called Staunton. Is anybody familiar with that term? The Staunton uh, chess set, it's the same. It's a good old plastic chess set you get from Ames. Well, is Ames around anymore? Kmart, Super K, I don't know what they call it here. Uh, if you go and just buy a traditional chess set with the horse, right, and it has the, the king with a crown, the queen and so forth, the round pawn, um, they, that was designed by a gentleman the last name was Staunton. And so it's sort of a, his style is what we now use in competition chess as well, that, that, that Staunton style. This set here um, is sort of a familiarity from that Staunton design, the round piece and then that kind of base. For some of my other pieces, I sort of took liberties to uh, uh, change it up a little bit, add a little flair for my uh, rooks. You can see I, like, I um, like the rook to have a little bit of weight to it, a little bit meaty. But again, playing with space, talking about adding uh, uh, space to your piece. A rook is generally like a castle piece. It's very meaty. So I just sort of kind of sucked in the, the interior part here to just kind of add a curve and kind of give it a little bit of thinness, but to still sort of be a little heavy. And in this other set, um, again, it's kind of a little narrow there in the tight. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see in the images here, but um, a little shape. Um, the bishop, I got two different bishops here. You can kind of see the different heads on them. One has a really large top, the other one a very tiny top. Just a couple of different styles, but it's reminiscent of a bishop that we are familiar with, with the Staunton style of, of pieces. 
Yeah, yeah, that helps. Just again, uh, trying different styles, but to get, before I designed these curves, I did this mathematical equation or basic to design my pieces and I would lay them out uh, across on my diagram and I would have my sizes and I could cut my wood blanks basically to fit that size. I would lay them all out, have them all laid out all at the same time before I started carving. King and queen, um, my king, tall and skinny, um, kind of a different crown on this one a little bit. Um, the, the maple set here has very small head to them, which is kind of interesting. Just again, a little, little something to tie the pieces together. The dark walnut set here has a little bit larger tops to them. The queen, I typically make a queen. She has kind of a dress, right? She's kind of floating, if you will. I kind of like that idea. It looks a little feminine, some nice curves, you know, um, sort of to distinguish those. I'm not a carver. I, I only use the lathe. Like the only time I use a chisel is to dig a hole or something like that or whatever. Cut off a little bit of wood. I don't really use um, carving tools, rotary tools. I'm not really that kind of person. I don't, this doesn't uh, appeal to me. So with the knights, with the horse, um, I did off-center turning. Um, and this, you can sort of see the, the, the heads on these. Not sure how close that is. Going to flip that over. Uh, you'll see they're kind of off center a little bit, and I'll show you how I do that as well. It's very simple off center turning techniques. Nothing very challenging, but uh, just a solid piece of wood, nonetheless. All right. So two different styles of chess pieces. Um, oh, my pawn. You can see this pawn very kind of modern. Still looks reminding uh, of a pawn-ish sort of size. This one, I, I personally like this style a little better. I like the ball and a little swoop down here. Another thing about designing your chess set to consider are sort of elements, and you learn this in Mike Darlow's book, elements that throughout one set uh, that sort of highlight it or suggest that they are together. And one place to do that on your chess set is with the base, okay? So like this, this piece here, I've got a certain style base that sort of is repeated through at different uh, proportions with the other pieces. Um, it's basically a fillet, a little step, a, a half a cove, and then a, and an angle in there. Um, the pawns are a little smaller, so I made that sort of memory pattern a little bit different. These other pieces here have a much wider base. Uh, the purpose of that I'll explain in a sec but um, different ways of holding the wood on the lathe uh, resulted in that. But a certain sort of pattern between them that kind of tie them together. Now, if I were to make a full uh, pair, if I were to make a, a true set, I would try, probably make them both identical. But here today, I just brought two different styles. So that's why I have these uh, shown. So when I first started making them, I was thinking to myself, I didn't know really how to hold the wood on the lathe quite right. Um, so I had to figure it out. My first attempt, I had uh, pin jaws. I don't know if anybody knows what pin jaws are. On your four jaw chuck, uh, these jaws, uh, I think they're called pin jaws. They're really tight. You close the chuck completely. I had maybe a, a radius of about, I think maybe three quarters of an inch. So what I had done was I took all my pieces of wood and I drilled a three quarter inch hole in there. And I put it. Well, if I, this were on here, I put it into the pin jaws and expand it out to hold that on there, okay? Uh, so each one of these, I, I currently I have filled them, uh, they have felt on the bottom at this point. But I had went in there, I expanded those jaws, and that's how I held it on there, because I wanted a free end so that I could carve the whole thing, sand it, and finish it completely right on the lathe. And in order to do that, you can't have the tailstock in the way. So um, I was able to do that. That was my first approach. And I made this set here. I didn't like it because the problem was those pin jaws to open up, I needed a pretty large hole. And it really restricted my design because these had a very fat bottom to them. And I didn't particularly care for that. I wanted to change that up a little bit. So my next technique was to, on this set, I drilled a hole in the bottom. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this approach here in just a moment. 
And I made this little device to hold them. It's a, call it a screw chuck, if you will. Yeah, uh, just a piece of wood, I had a screw. Um, I'll show you how I kind of approached it. But basically you have this piece of wood, you got to true it up nice and uh, sharp on both sides. Hold it in the four jaw chuck, drill a hole in the center. Excuse me, and then you thread the screw through the underside and it protrudes out just enough. So you got to get your screw first, determine how much length you need to stick out depending upon the size of the piece you're doing. And then you drill a hole in the bottom of your piece, this threads on and it holds it nice and tight. A lot more flexibility in your design because I'm no, I'm no longer limited to my base being, you know, this kind of fat chunky thing because I have a large hole in there. So I preferred this style um, to create my pieces. It gave me more flexibility of design. Um, however, one thing that I did enjoy about this set was because I had that large hole, I then filled it with lead shot, little BBs, you know, filled it in there. I poured epoxy in there and it adds some weight to them. So when it comes time to checkmate, you can just go checkmate and you slam it down. You know, make it known that the game is over. Um, it's kind of nice to have that heft to them. You pick it up, it doesn't feel feathery light, uh, like, like small pieces of wood uh, tend to. A lot of the, when you buy really nice uh, chess sets out there, there's a lot of them. Uh, they usually are weighted to a certain uh, degree uh, for comfort and ease of use and familiarity, especially for competition chess. Um, so that, that's one thing that this other approach does not lend itself to uh, rather easily. Because you have a small hole, you really can't put anything in there. One could, I suppose, find a mechanism to maybe put a, let's say, a, a washer or some kind of other device on there. Uh, I chose not to with this set, uh, just because I'm lazy. Um, so that's, that, that, um, if anybody has any questions along the way, yeah. Um, it should seat all the way. Is that what's your question? No, on the device itself, the screw chuck, does the screw thread into the all the way? It goes like it um, all the way to here? No, no, no. Within your left hand. Oh, does this go all the way? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Correct. I see what you're saying. It is thread in. It is nice and tight. It is. Sheet rock screw. So it's thread all the way. It's like a The screw itself is this long. Yeah. Looks like a number eight screw, maybe a six. Um, so I did drill that hole all the way through. The reason I do it this way um, is such that when you tighten this, <coughs> it squeezes this piece of wood does that make sense so right so it tightens down a little bit um don't use for this piece of wood if you make a screw chuck don't use a soft piece of wood like pine it will it'll just it's too soft and the screw will embed itself and it'll, it'll wear down quite easily maple will certainly be better something more dense uh, this is just a piece of walnut um and your screw makes some um i like to use decking screws for holding my bowls, uh, my face plates. But those decking screws have little teeth on them that kind of encourage them to screw into the wood. I don't know if anybody's familiar with those, just below the thing. Yeah, I wouldn't encourage using that on this either because it will sort of bur burrow its way into the wood some. Uh, or if you had a washer, that would ensure that it stays put. But the idea here is that when you tighten this down onto it, it will really secure itself nice and tight. So I can really get it on there good and tight and the screw, you know, and it should be nice and centered. Okay. And then it should thread off. If um, you need to make sure that the hole you drill into here is such that the threads will catch the wood pretty securely because we are going to turn this uh, without the tail stock for a period of time. So you do need this to be sturdy and, and hold a grip. To hold that on there. Do you find one side of the test for chuck to match up scroll chuck? Um, will it recenter itself? I'm hoping it's recentering itself because this is not the one I used. 
So I think it will. This, I think, uh, this was milled perfectly square, not on wood, I think. But I, and ideally, so that it should grip equally uh, with any tr chuck I transfer it to. Uh, if, if one were to be more considerate, uh, you could maybe find a way to put this on a faceplate, something that would hold this insecure, so you could always be determined that it's perfect. Um, it's. Um, I just had it. Uh, I just did it. I could have made it. Around. That would have been more time. Come on. <laughs> we got time. We've got time to make things around. Um, yeah, I'm going to start with this. Um, so let me close this down. This is a very nice machine. This is what I use uh, for most of my work as a Powermatic, but it's a little more beat up. This is kind of nice. Um, all right, let me get this out of the way. Put this over. Yeah, well, it, you know, I'm totally down for trading, straight up. Uh, it's really nice and smooth. All right, um, so I'm going to keep a couple pieces because I might uh, discuss them as I'm carving. All right. So what I, when I start to make a set, I will cut all my pieces of wood um, based, based on my measurements if I were to do so. Sorry, I didn't draw a little more, but I would cut them all. And let's say my, my intended result might be two inches. I would cut the piece of wood maybe two and a quarter, give myself a little waste material at the top. <coughs> and it would look something like this. This one is a piece of cherry. Um, I had, uh, so um, sometimes when I get wood, I get a, you get a whole tree or something, you, and you, you carve it up for bowls or hollow forms or what have you. You have little pieces. And you're like, what do I do with this? Or you got a big chunk and it has crack in it. Well, I can't make a bowl out of it. But you can make stock to turn later. So what I'll do is I'll take those pieces of wood over my bandsaw and just manipulate it and then kind of cut it into uh, manageable sizes. And it'll be as long or short as the piece of wood lends itself to. But knowing that I was going to make chess sets, or um, I would just say to myself, I set up my shop, and I'll just have all these pieces of wood, and I'll set up my um, fence on my saw and just rip a bunch of these. You know, you end up with a couple of crates full of them. And you just, I wax the ends, set them aside, forget about it until you get a demonstration at Thetford Academy, and then you can pull them out. Um, and so that's it. Uh, a good way to, to, to take that other material out, out of your wood that you might not use, preserve it for later, super easy stuff. You can, you can even make a rolling pin material or something of that nature, longer pieces out of wood that might not be good for bowls. Um, so I'll take this, and it's very roughly two by two, so, um, don't measure. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hold it into the chuck here. I'm not too worried initially about it being completely on center. Um, I don't mill this perfectly. I, it's rough. If it were round, it would be round. If not, it's not. But I just want to kind of loosely secure it in here. Pull up the tail stock just to kind of help get it close to center. And just to kind of make sure, you know, it's fairly close. I don't need the tail stock, but. It doesn't hurt. I'm just going to tighten this down. What I'm going to do first is, uh, as the wood sits now, I had a chest piece to come out of this. It's positioned in this orientation. So the bottom of my chest piece is over here. The top of my chest piece will be on this side right now. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to true up this bottom part. So I want to get a nice flat. Because the problem is the chop saw, I, I'm not really, I can't get that perfectly flat and then hold it on here nice and evenly. So I like to true up my pieces on the lathe, get them nice and flat before I put it on to my screw chuck. So in order to do that, pull up the tool over here. Uh, I'm just gonna change the belt system a little bit. So spindle turning, uh, especially small stuff, you can get your lathe cranking. You know, just, just go for it. It's kind of fun. 
because um, it's a small thing. So I'm gonna I put this onto the higher um, belt pulley system. And there we go. And they're spinning good. All right, tools. Let me uh, quickly talk about the basic tools that I use. And I don't have many. Um, I'll initially start my carving with a roughing gouge. All right, everybody's familiar with a roughing gouge. You don't use it on a bowl. If you do, set up a camera so that you can warn everybody else about what not to do later. And then we can all see. Uh, but this is a roughing gouge uh, intended for spindle turning. It's a very common tool. Some folks who are new to turning oftentimes think that it's a bowl gouge, but just don't do that. Um, I use this to, to turn the wood uh, from square to cylinder, and it's a pretty straightforward tool. Another, another tool that's handy is a parting tool. Uh, is everybody, everybody not familiar with a parting tool? Everybody's got the parting tool? Okay. Uh, it's a diamond uh, parting tool, so it's a little wider in the center than it is on the ends. Um, but this can be a very useful tool for repetition. Okay, so if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about <coughs> duplicating stuff, one of the fun, one of the things we sometimes overlook is that we have a constant measurement tool here, or any tool that you might have. So if you measure the end of your tool, your parting tool, I believe this is like three sixteenths. I'll know that any time I have this tool, if I hold it up onto my piece of wood, I've got a 3 16 ruler right there. So when I'm designing a chess set, if I say to myself, well, this feature is 3 16 down at the very bottom. It's the width of my tool. So every pawn that I do, all 16 of these, the dark ones plus the white ones that I have to do, the bottom unit is 3 16 so I don't necessarily need to take a, an extra story stick. I didn't explain a story stick, but I won't need to hold something up here to tell me uh, right where that, cu where, where that cut is, because I know that cut to do this second cut is exactly the width of my tool. The second feature is also the width of my tool, and the third feature is half of the width of my tool. So you can use this as a measuring stick to help you repeat um, if you're doing a, a volume of stuff. This is a small thing. Of course, it doesn't necessarily apply to every application. But in this phase, your design phase, let's, um, let me just draw. Does, it, does that kind of make sense to folks what I'm, what I'm talking about? Because you could get parting tools that are a quarter of an inch. Well, you might have a feature that's a quarter of an inch. Well, you got that tool sitting right there. There's no you, don't, you don't need to turn the lathe off, get your ruler out. Grab your quarter inch tool and you kind of mark it out. And that can help you along the way uh, to save time. There's nothing more tedious than making a friggin' chess set, I tell you. You like you had eight, 16, 32 pieces to go after. Um, starting rough like this, it just takes, takes a, a little bit of time. So I use, uh, when I'm in my design phase, let me just draw. I will use this tool if I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to draw large. All right, now let's say it comes, scoops up like this. All right, and then I sort of have it uh, angled out like that. And then a big cove in here comes in like that. And it flares in like this. And it's a big ball on top. Yeah, that's not too bad. I haven't done that in a long time. Um, so it's really unproportional. But anyways, this lower part here would be one width of my tool. This part here, one width of my tool. This feature here is half. All right. Um, and up here, you know, I, I would have basically... Um, when I would cut my full set, if I had them all, as I mentioned a moment ago, I would cut it about maybe a quarter inch higher uh, than the final piece. So you could use your parting tool if you wanted to do three eighths, for instance, you would know that your waste material might be one width of your tool and you can have an identifier of where this part is. And you might even know where that is by also measurement um, as well. Some of, the, some of the duplicating, particularly for these chess pieces, I sort of do it by eye. 
Uh, a lot of these, the size of the, you know, the shape of the, the curl here is um, proportional. You try to make it round. But um, again, I'm not a very articulate turner in that respect. I don't get too concerned about things. My excuse is that every pawn is a person, and so they have personality. And so while they're all human, they're all a little different, right? Uh, so that's, that's kind of the way I approach it. But using your tools, think about it. It's a nice measuring stick. You get a lot of them, and it can really be handy for saving time, especially if you have like a one-inch skew. A lot of people have that. I don't use a skew very much. It's a tool I never really focused on. Um, that being said, I occasionally will use it uh, if I need to get in a really sharp area or make a really fine detail. But uh, the skew is um, something I don't really use much. So I use the roughing gouge, the parting tool, and the spindle gouge. All right. um, these are one-way uh, tools, half-inch spindle gouge. And I've got it ground back, um, the double bevel in there, so a really short cutting edge up at the tip. If anybody has any questions along the way about my tools or whatnot, please ask. What I'm going to do now is just kind of cut this round. I'm going to square up the bottom before I drill a hole into it. So. Just like that. And then, um, Grab my spindle gouge. I'm just going to turn down the side. That cut I just did right there, putting pressure down the bottom, it's nice to have the tailstock there. Because sometimes when you're doing that cut, putting pressure this way, if you're out a little too far, your wood can tweak in that grip if you didn't tighten it down enough, or maybe you're not, you know, just didn't grip strong enough. With the tailstock there, it holds it nice and steady. I can make a little more aggressive cut knowing that I have that support um, and get it nice and clean. And then I'll just pull the tailstock away to sort of finish it up, be a little gentler with my cut to make sure it doesn't tweak in the grip. And another thing, can you see it really well? Can we get this one on? This one here? You see how well you can see. Um, basically, oh, here we go. So when I'm doing this cut, and a lot of folks want to know what it means to ride the bevel. Um, riding the bevel is when the back of the tool, the back of your bevel, is touching the wood, um, with or without the cutting edge touching the wood. Okay. Now, what I typically do as I'm carving this, instead of engaging the tip right into the wood initially diving right in. I'll touch the back of the tool to the wood, and then I'll engage the tip from there. Now, I'm not sure how well it can be seen here. Let me do it, let me if I do this right here. Um, so you see the back of the tool is on the wood. As I ease the tool forward, the tip will then engage the wood, and that's my the perfect location to cut when you're riding the bevel. You, you support that cut, pinch it in between the cut basically so the pressure against your tip uh, the back of your bevel is all is being supported in the cut so as i'm doing this cut here on the bottom i'm constantly the bottom of the tool is always on the wood and i'll and i'll bring it in make a cut then pull it back leaving it on the wood reset and do another cut and then reset and do another cut so the tool never actually comes off the wood it's always on there and it's riding the bevel for this particular cut that I'm doing right here. And that's how you can, main, you can work uh, in succession. Instead of making one pass, taking the tool away, going back again, trying to find your edge, okay? Um, there's little tricks like this that can help you just move through your process uh, more correctly. So you can hear, I'm engaging the wood, I'm not cutting anything, but as I move the tip towards the wood, the wood shavings come off, I'll make a cut, then I'll back up again, make another cut. And that's kind of the, something that we can do at this operation, but you can also do it in many other capacities on the inside of a bowl, on the outside of a bowl, riding the bevel, then introduce your tip.
That's, that's a really handy little thing. It's a little trickier when you need to make a clean cut starting on the outside here, so you gotta be a little more stable with your hand. But once the tool dives into the wood, you can ride that bevel nice and easily, get a good clean cut. Just like that, that's, uh, that's perfect, actually. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Um, get it close, nice and flat. At this point, if I were to be actually doing a full chest set, I would sand this bottom. Pardon me. If I uh, were to want it to be uh, exposed, uh, the wood at the bottom. If I were to put felt on the bottom, I might not need to worry about it. But this is the last time I'll be able to uh, touch the bottom of my chest piece while it's on the lathe. So I would address that at this time. However, what I'm gonna do, Oops, sorry, take that off. I get a drill chuck, a uh, little Jacob's chuck, a little hand twister. There's a drill bit in there. I think it's the right size for what I need. It's a little small, but it might still work. Everybody uh, familiar with these drill chucks and so forth? Really handy little tools. So I would take this. I think I got it on center. With these, some of these uh, drill chucks, it's hard to make sure your grip is right on center. All right, set this up. There it goes, on center, drill a hole. Sometimes I'll just use the tail stock like this, and slide it in. Get it in enough, make sure I'm deep enough. I need to drill a hole, you know, Enough for this whole thing to fit in. If I go a little further, it's all right. You just don't want to go shy of, of how much your piece is sticking out. What I just did here is also how I made this to start. But I would drill the hole all the way through. I'd clean up the end, drill the hole all the way through. If one were inclined to do so, you could build a little tenon grip on this end um, that might fit in your jaw. Instead of leaving it square, you could do it round, right? You could make this whole thing round. Uh, put a little foot on there for your, your uh, compression uh, tenon, drill a hole all the way through, <clears throat> and then put your screw in thereafter. And then that's how you can make this. All right, so repeat 36 times, or 32. Repeat 32 times. I would literally, I'd do this to all the pieces. I'd have them lined up, one right on there, true up the bottom, drill your hole. All right. How are we on time? Am I? I have a tendency to, okay, <laughs> that's good. I have a tendency sometimes to just wander in my thoughts. I um, hope you don't mind. Okay, cool. All right, so <clears throat> you got your piece. It doesn't look anything like a chest set piece yet, but uh, I got a flat box, and that's critical because we want it to sit nice and flat. Um, then what I would do is take uh, this piece here and I will put it onto one of my grippers. See how this comes down. Good and tight. Secure it down. Hopefully that's be nice and centered. Yeah. Good enough for demonstration purposes. Nice, there we go. So that's good, that's right where it needs to be. Now here's another little tidbit, uh, like a trick you could do to help uh, with duplication if you're doing this sort of thing. Um, the diameter of the bottom of each piece, I kind of want it to be fairly uniform, particularly across the ponds. When I do my king or the queen or even the rook or the knight, they'll be a little larger than will be my pawn. Um, you can set that diameter to this piece of wood here, right? So if I go to my measurement, oh, it's an inch and seven eighths. I'll go to my chuck here with my calipers or whatnot, carve this to an inch and seven eighths. Then I know every piece of wood should start a little proud of an inch and seven eighths. So that when I screw this on, it should be above that size. 
And then I'll know that I, uh, to carve down two right where that wood is. Every one of them, if I use the same chuck, boom, you're all set. It's kind of like those pen turners that have those mandrels. Yeah. Any pen turners here? A lot of pens here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I don't make a lot of pens. I make a lot of jokes about pen makers. I'm just kidding. All right, so that's on there. It's a little wobbly, I think, because I wasn't too cautious about the um, that centerpiece. But in theory, that should be a nice 90 degree uh, split from the bottom um, so that it'll be nice and trued up. If one wanted to, you could use um, your tail stock, and I think I will just pull this out for the initial shaping here. Uh, stick it out quite a bit. There you go. It's not a bad idea if you're going to do a little more aggressive cutting to have your tail stock because uh, that screw alone is not reliable uh, to be really aggressive to hold it good and tight. And another reason to maybe add a little more distance on your uh, blank rather than cutting it to uh, the exact length that you're after. Uh, so you have some waste material for that pin to kind of dig into. There it goes. So now it's spinning, if you can't tell. So then I'll just sort of turn it into a cylinder using, uh, I'm going to use that uh, the screw chuck as a diameter gauge. I'll just make a nice straight cylinder from there. Pardon? And then just to say, I was just going to speed it up. So let's go all the way. Let's get it going fast. So about 32 under. Too. Tastes like the cherry. Get it down to a cylinder nice and straight like this. Doesn't need to be too perfect because we're going to carve it and change the shape uh, considerably here for us anyway. This one actually looks more like a bishop size, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll sort of mimic this one here, even though the, the block of wood is a little larger. Um, you could do that cut with a skew. There's a few different tools you could do uh, to make that cut, clean that up. So, but basically you want to get that nice, nice and round. So let's say I'm going to do the measurement here and I'm going to three eighths of an inch or three sixteenths, three sixteenths. And then that'll be half of three sixteenths where that sharp point is. And I'll do my swoop there. So using this tool, I don't know if you can see here, I can kind of just, when I turn the lathe on, I won't go too fast, it makes a lot of noise. If I take my tool, eyeball the left side of my tool to the left side of my piece of wood, that's my piece, I'm gonna sort of just then kind of roll the tool a little bit to dig in that right edge, just to make a little scribe line. That'll tell me kind of right where I need to be. It's not a very deep scribe line, but it's enough for me to identify here. And I can do that again. So I'm going to push in a little bit. Um, here's where my craft might be a little bit uh, not as articulate as I just go in a little bit, right? I don't go in like, I don't get my calipers and really give it too much uh, weight to about carefulness, not for this project anyway. So I would just go in a little bit um, and then I might uh, do that again over for this, this next one out here come in just a little further. Kind of like that. And I sort of have a three step, I don't know how well you can see, sort of three steps down there. And then I would go to my spindle gouge and you might just uh, create the curve that I'm looking for right in there. And then um, 
and say to myself, well, okay, so I have a piece of wood because I'm not being too articulate. Um, I need to mark here. I have a pencil. Pencil. <laughs> I never come prepared. That's the one thing about being a word like lazy your name on it for a pencil for two years, and they have to keep that one pencil the whole time. Oh, don't worry. Cool. Thank you. Um, well, hold. I'm just going to make a quick little reference to that piece there. At this stage, if, if one were to have a, a story stick, does people know what a story stick is? That's another thing that when you're first uh, trying to do more duplicating stuff, if you have yourself a story stick, it can make the process a little bit easier uh, to move through. And a story stick is nothing more than an extra piece of wood, say plywood, something thin, and you literally make marks on your plywood about critical dimensions or, or locations. So if I were to do so, I might hold a piece of wood up here, for instance, and I'd mark this line here, maybe mark this one, this one, top one, and right here. And I would have those laid out. So even while this thing's all spinning, you can then just hold it up here nice and easy, make your pencil lines. Um, very common practice to do that for spindle turning. And so while it's spinning, if you pop your lines in there, you get your dimensions. Now, holding your piece up here, if you can see, I've got some meat to remove in this section and I get the ball to turn. Much of this I, I typically just do by eye. Again, if you're more careful, you want to be more articulate, get out some calipers, okay? Get your calipers and you can measure and you can dial it in really, really tight. Personally, I'm, again, I'm just not that type of turner. What I'm gonna do is sort of some carving techniques. And I'll talk a little bit about the way. If anybody has a question, certainly please ask. Sometimes when I get carving, I just zone in, you know? And you don't want to really want to talk to anybody anymore. I think you all know what I mean by that. So I just using the party tool to just kind of get away this waste material over here. It's essentially gonna be cut off. This is going to be my ball right in this region. I'll use my party tool again to come down. That cut right there, sort of identifying this right here. Okay, so this remaining portion is going to be uh, the sphere on the top. Right? Now this other part. I'm bring that down as well. So. I think what I'll do is just get rid of all this waste material anyway. Pop that off. Then I'll come in with a spindle gouge. Um, spindle gouges come in all, you know, everybody kind of grinds their gouge a little bit differently. I'm sure you know. Um, I don't know if you can get it. Yep, here we go. Close up on my gouge. Need like a sort of see it there. Um, so I like it to be pretty pointy at the tip. All right? I like a nice narrow front. Gets it nice and tight so you get in tight areas. Um, some gouges have a bigger sweep to them, such as this uh, roughing gouge. If you look at this one, it has a much wider sweep than does my spindle gouge. Uh, has a different purpose. It's more for just turning cylinders or doing subtle tapers. Um, this, uh, this narrow tip does create some problems on the side uh, of your tool. It doesn't really cut too well, very deep down the wings. So you gotta be cautious about that when you do have a narrow uh, tool as such. And I also do a double bevel. So my cutting edge is that front portion, maybe a quarter inch of cutting bevel. And then I have uh, removed the heel uh, quite considerably, just freehand on the lathe. Again, it, it sort of narrows down, allows me to get into tighter areas. Uh, when I do that double bevel, I usually just leave it, and then I'll, when I return to the grinder, I'll just grind the, the, the primary bevel. Uh, and eventually, that primary bevel gets a little longer and longer as you carve down, and eventually I'll just decide at some point to, to carve that heel uh, back a little further. 
I think this tool, yeah, this one I didn't do the double bevel. They are the same, uh, well, you can see, but they are the same angle, cutting angle, primary angle. This one I just didn't do the double bevel. Uh, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. But these one way tools, I don't know if anybody uses one way steel. Um, great, double ended, right? So you can sharpen both sides. If you're thinking about production or saving time, they're really handy. And I like their steel as well. But, uh, it's pretty much all I use is the one way stuff. Um, cool. So once you get, uh, you can see how quick you can sort of get your critical dimensions here. It can happen kind of fast. If you use calipers, it'll slow you down a little bit, which is okay. But it depends on what you're kind of after, what you're looking for. I have. Yep. yep. Yes, this here. This is the handle. Yeah. So this just pops out like that. Yeah. It slides in. I do a lot more bowl turning than I do spindle turning. Um, it's great because you can, I have like four of these double ended, and you just line them up. And then when you're carving, you know, instead of running over to the grinder, just pop it off, flip it around, and it comes to your final cut. You get a good clean one, and you can make the pass. And a little more ease of uh, production in that capacity, depending upon how much you want to do. Or you know, another good thing about having double-ended gouges, if you uh, if you want uh, two different types of grinds on the end of your tool, if you have you want two tools, one with a pointier tip, one with a less pointy tip, you could do that alternately as well. All right, so. Going to use some spindle turning techniques that are fairly basic. Riding, you can hear riding the bevel, right? That's what that, that sound is. And then as I ride the bevel, I'll introduce the tool to the wood, the tip, the cutting edge to the wood before I cut. Bring that down and around. There. So when you're doing the motions of spindle turns, it's very challenging for people to understand the mechanics behind riding the bevel and getting a nice rotation. Some folks really lend, uh, pick up the skew quite easily, which can be uh, has its own sort of subtleties to creating round shapes. But I personally prefer spindle gouge because uh, I haven't figured out how to use a skew. Um, as I'm standing here now, I'm realizing that the, the, the ball here at the top is a little large on my piece that I'm carving. So I got to trim it down just a little bit. Another point of that I didn't do, but if I had, sometimes what I'll do is I, again, uh, a little more production. I'll have a little piece of wood, let's say something like this cap, that would sit in here, right? Almost like the gentleman who had that piece over there to, to help center the gadget. And that would be of a diameter that would be matching of the tip here, okay? So that I could then, again, with relative ease, get those all the same. Thinking about trying to efficiency to try to move through all 16 pieces that you want to look similar. Um, and that's another little cheat that you can do because once you get that diameter set and you got your width set, then it's all up to you to be able to create a sphere or a round shape or whatever shape you're after. And, it, and I, I, I personally don't like to use really uh, articulate templates because I, I, what I like about this craft is being able to do it myself. Close, but not perfect. So, so creating a sphere, chess pieces at this stage, it's really just spindle turning. 
you can, you don't need to practice, say, making chess pieces uh, to learn spindle turning. You can what I offer, what I would typically do for folks when they want to learn spindle turning is you make a stick and you just repeat doing these beads over and over and over and over and over and over. Then you do coves over and over and over and over and over. Um, and here I'm just applying all of those sort of elements to what I'm doing here. When it comes to making a bead, um, um, so let's say. This is my piece of wood. Um, if I want to, let me think here. I'm going to take this back a little bit. I'm going to do this, come up and over here. So what I want to do is turn this square into a circle. I need to cut this direction, and I need to cut this direction. Oops, sorry, I'm electrified. You don't, I don't recommend starting your initial cut right on center and then doing it in one pass. Okay, that's a little bit trickier depending upon the size of the project you're doing. You want to sort of chip away at those corners, little bites at a time. All right, so particularly when you're learning to start, you need to, you want to watch that balance take place because we're trying to balance out that round shape. So if I, Chip this corner, then I'll chip that corner, then I'll chip this one a second time, add a little curve to it, and then I'll go back to the other side. So you sort of work down both sides symmetrically. Visually, that will help you uh, see it come into fruition. Some folks, when they're doing beads and coves, they'll leave that square and they'll leave this square over here. They'll just simply keep attacking this until it's sort of roundish. And then they'll come over here and sort of tack this side until it's roundish and it just doesn't quite balance out. You know, you struggle with it. So if you do a little bit and try to repeat one side then the other, that will help you kind of bring it down to that final shape. Now, I usually try to use the phrase, cut off your high spots. Okay, because when you're starting with a square and you want to make a round, this is our goal somewhere in here. Okay, that's our, our intended goal. You got a high spot right here, so you chip it, right? And then you chip the next one, you chip the next one. And then maybe you just chip this one here. So your shape kind of comes like this. And then you might just chip that one and sand that little spot. And then a little cut here, and a couple little cuts. You don't have to struggle with trying to do it in one pass all the time. I think a lot of new beginners to, the spindle turning struggle with wanting, well, I, I should be able to do it just once. They just keep focusing on that. But if you think about taking little bits at a time, you'll eventually get it down to the shape that you're, that you're after. And, and then later on, once you're more comfortable with identifying the shape and how to create the shape, then you can incorporate longer cuts, say. Eventually, you'll be able to start right here and finish right here with no problem. And with confidence that you're not going to remove too much material. Because that's what happens when people make beads. If they end up, instead of carving it nice and round, it comes down and whoop, there's that little thing. They're like, you know, and the next thing you know, they go to the other side and it's up here. They're oh man, now I'm really out of whack. And then you get your sandpaper out and your 60 grit and you're going after it, you know? Um, <laughs> so you gotta be careful about that. Um, beads. Um, if we have some time afterwards, we can kind of maybe you know, throw up some wood and we can talk about how to make beads. Um, but um, working with that, that shape. But also, when you're creating a, uh, uh, an open-ended bead as this is, okay, this is not an inline bead, okay, meaning there, it, it terminates here, and there's nothing more. If inline would be a bead and a bead and a bead and a bead and a bead, or even another feature. And on this side of it, there's uh, that curve that comes down and meets more wood. So in order to make it proportional, you need to understand that register that there's a location in there where the curve should visually continue through out and around, sort of into that base, if that makes sense, right? So you don't want to turn a full bead, and for a chess piece, you don't want to turn a bead and then have your next part come, your next piece of wood be like that close, it's just too fragile. You need to have your lower piece sort of come into here, and then you'll have your collar or what have you in that section while this is open. 
So you need to somehow visualize that curve going into that lower spot, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's with your open-ended sort of rounded shape. And that is really challenging for some people to visualize in the, in the piece they're doing. So sometimes what'll happen for folks is they'll make a really nice curve on the open end, and then this other end sort of comes in blunts down short or something like that. It'll be kind of squished or a little compact. So you can be cautious of that. Again, it's more practice than anything to try to get it uh, more balanced visually for you down the road. And if you're like me, you just don't give it on. And whatever you get, you get, right? I'm just playing. So I get it, uh, I get that top piece good and round. And what I'll do next, still using my spindle gouge, I'm gonna kind of carve this under part in here, this section right in there. And that's a cove. Okay, beads and coves, tapers and fillets, that's what um, spindle turning is all about. Notice how I'm going back and forth. I didn't mention that, but in the same idea with that bead, when you're making a cove, you want to sort of come down one side and then go down the other side. And I return to the initial side and I go down the other side. And I evenly bring it down. Pardon? Cut downhill, Cut right. Don't pull your tool up the other side. For folks who don't know, it will, uh, it can, when you reach, let's say, a critical uh, transition like this one right here, if I were to pull from down inside the bead up to the outside, I, I, I chance ripping those fibers out, making a very uneven surface at that sharp transition. So good point. You want to start at your larger diameter and go down to your smaller diameter. Okay, that's the best approach. So that's why I go from left to right and so forth and so on. Now, sometimes um, you might end up with a little bit of frayed material here, right at that sharp transition. Uh, but what actually what I need to do is make this little cove right in there, just that little cut, little undercut, add a little bit of a feature. And I'm going to dive the tool tip just straight in, like that. Punch that in there. That could be done with a skew. Probably be done cleaner with a skew, but this is pretty perfect if I do say so myself. Sandpaper. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sandpaper is honestly a good approach if you're struggling because it's, I, I tell people, you know, if you get if, if you're in the stages of learning, we can stand here for 15 minutes and try to dial it in. Or we could be like, oh, I got close this time, sand it, and then the next time you get a little closer, right? And then, because um, although some folks really do like to focus on their technique and really stay in tune and learn just that thing, I'd move on to another little section and try to dial it in. One little tip you can do is sort of, this tool as it sits right now is a little wider than my uh, uh, cove allows me to get in there comfortably. But if one were to have a, a little more open, you could sort of just tweak it around a little left and right at the bottom of your cove. Come down and it just sort of gently blend it in. Uh, it's a very delicate cut. It's hard sometimes in a really deep cove to ride the bevel at the bottom of your cove. Shortening your bevel, sort of like what I've done on this tool, will allow you to get more in there, a little tight. For those who don't understand that, the double bevel allows you to carve a tighter radius. Okay, so when I use this other spindle gouge that has a bevel that's, you know, probably three eighths or so, maybe more uh, distance here, it can only really do it in a certain radius. Cove. I couldn't do that cove, but this one is a much shorter bevel from the cutting edge just to here, and it can do a tighter turn. So this one will allow me to get to the bottom of that cove a little bit easier and just to gently touch it up. 
But I would, but honestly, like, don't be bashful about a little bit of sandpaper. You know, you get it, you get it really close, and then the sandpaper will just finish it up. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Grab a different gouge. Exactly. Yeah. For for the tools you have. Something tiny like this. Um, I saw that that spindle over there with the sandpaper wrapped around it. You could do that if, if you want to be really articulate about sanding. If you're doing a bunch, you make that stick. And if you had that stick and sandpaper wrapped around it, you could even fit it inside that cove and just kind of wiggle it back and forth. We're talking a matter of seconds, not, not very long. Um, and depending upon the caliber of craft that you really want to delve into, uh, one can, it is possible to do it straight from the tool to like a, you know, starting to sand with 6,000 grit, but it's not essential. Um, I think for a lot of us who are just trying to get something done, a little, little sandpaper doesn't really hurt too much. Although sandpaper will dull uh, your sharp edges if you want to retain really nice crisp transitions. You got to be careful about that. Sandpaper really quickly round those over. Sometimes with some pieces, I like to have a little more articulate uh, transitions than others. I did have a little bit of tear out on this, so I'm just going to kind of bring that back some. Here's where a skew could be handy to get in there nice and tight. Even like that. As it sits right now, my bead, my large bead here at the head of the tool, I'm going to mark it where I do have, because you probably can't see. Of course, I just made a mark where I didn't want to. Couple of spots right there. I don't know if you can see those too well. They're sort of, um, if one were to critique this, which I hope nobody ever does, um, you'll see that <laughs> this upper one here, I noticed just visually, there's a, it's a little bit up. It's a little rise, okay? I didn't quite get it perfect. Uh, this lower one down here, the same situation, just down on that inside curve. is a little bit of a bump, probably as small as a bump could be, but uh, it's there, and I'm okay with that. Because the sandpaper, again, you can hit it with 180 grit, even 220, and for a piece this size, it's gone. It's not going to stick around, a little rise like that. If you have a divot, that's another issue. You can't quickly sand away a divot as you can a little bump. Um, so you bet, if I did have a divot, I would go after it again with the tool. I marked this center part because I wanted to say uh, when, I'm, when you're doing a nice balanced bead, um, when you get your diameter of your bead, as it were, in a square, if I were to do a square like this, I wouldn't carve the middle. Okay, my tool shouldn't touch that middle because that's my maximum diameter and that's what uh that's the, the the highest point of my arc so i would only carve here and over here you know and it would correspond down below as it's fine and i would approach there but i would always retain that center point as you're learning visually if it's helpful mark it like i did right here mark your center point be like that's my center point I need to balance away from that. Making that little dot right there, you know, that line, it will just give you some reference on where your arc wants to go to. Another little trick for beginners to just try to pick up and learn how to do beads to keep that nice and balanced. So that's why I marked that there, just so you can see. Um, and then this piece is, um, you know, I would just hit it with some sandpaper. Uh, to, to hide all of my mistakes uh, and then you know bring it down to as fine a grid as you like everybody's a little bit different some people go to 220 some people want to go to 1000 for your finish some people want to use a urethane some people might use a ca glue on this they're all fine they're all doable some people might just be satisfied with beeswax and mineral oil or whatever wax you might choose um, i typically when i do my sanding uh, i'm generally fairly concerned about the dust. I do a lot of turning around dust a lot. 
I don't prefer to be. So what I'll do is, if uh, I have a couple of different types of vacuums. I have a, a Powermatic uh, full, you know, canister uh, dust collector with, you know, six inch hose. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have that six inch hose, boom, right here, and I'll clamp it. And then just turn that sucker on, it sands away. And it's great. It sucks in all that dust. You might put this in reverse, hold your sandpaper on top, and it sands it right away, spits it right into that hose. If you don't have a big hose, all you have is a shop vac. Same thing. Have your shop vac hose, bring it right up here, get a quick grip, quick grip clamp, just clamp it right to here. The hose is dangling right here. Turn that sucker on, and it's right there. It gets your dust immediately. So you don't need a big, fancy shop dust collection system to, to be safe here while you're, while you're doing something small, like a, a piece like this. But certainly you do want to be thoughtful of that dust collection. So um, we would go through, sand it, and be done, and just take it off. Spin it off, and you basically, this one doesn't look anything like my original, <laughs> but that's all right. Um, that's, that's the basic approach that I would use uh, to make a chest piece. That's the sequence of cuts, how to hold it on here, okay? Um, that's that. And I would certainly uh, do the same thing with all the pieces, the queen, the rook, yada, yada, yada. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions? Right, um, probably not. I, I would stick to the same thing. Maybe use your tailstock up here. I don't know if you were to have this on here. Uh, much of your, your carving may consist of uh, leaving the tailstock in place. Do all your shape, right? And then when you get down to really being close to done, you might have a little bit extra up here, that quarter inch of waste material. And then you can um, trim that off, move, remove this and trim that off nice and easily, and then hit it with some sandpaper. Uh, typically, my king and queens, uh, they're not too terribly long. And they get away with the same thing. You know, kind of, they stick out a little further. But go just like that. Yes, for the night. Yes, let me do that. You are just challenging me here, aren't you? Oh, boy. So... When it comes to a knight, again, I, I'm not a carver. I don't really do that much. Uh, I do need, this is a stub sound. Uh, we need a drive center for that. I think this will work. I've never used this style. Yeah, if you have a four prong, it's more familiar for me. I'm gonna take off the truck. For this piece, actually, oh, um, I do need to true it up first. I would take the same approach um, to true up the bottom. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me put this in. You know, one thing about off-center turning is I typically can't stand it. I find it, it's interesting and I'm intrigued by it and it's curious, but it's so hard to make something that I find very appealing. I mean, it often looks like something gone awry. Things kind of all in every which way. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows uh, Jean-Francois Escoulin. Does anybody know that name? He does some exceptional off-center work. Um, from France, he's out of France, and he um, his stuff has the balance and uh, visual sort of aesthetic that I I lend myself to. But his, his I mean, he's like one of those guys that very hard to approach for your layman. Um, but this night that I did is off center. It's just one axis off center. I'll show you how I do that. What I'm going to do is true up the bottom, very similar to the way I trued up that other piece. See what I mean? Just it's already off center. Yeah. 
<laughs> that was it. All done. Just, just loosen it up. I like that in there. There. Let's see if I can clean up that bottom now. Gonna just, uh, just tap that in the middle. So a little button. All right. So take take this piece out. This is the one part where you do need just a, a drive center. I use a four prong drive center. Put that in there. Everybody's familiar with one of these. Right. I use something very similar. Does anybody know the big bite? One way's big bite. Ever heard of that? Um, I use that for when I'm turning bowls. It's very similar. Compression chuck when I'm roughing out my bowl material. Um, and I kind of like it. They refer to it as jam chucking. So I got that on center. All right. So this is the bottom. Let me grab it so you can see. Grab a couple here. There. So, with this piece, this lower section is on center. This upper section is on center, the initial main center. This part right here is on center, and this part is off center. Okay? So, I'll show you how I approach that pretty quickly here. Put this on, lock it in there, bring up my tail. Although, I realized I didn't uh, do it quite right because I'm supposed to actually create my grip. There. I'm not going to be perfectly on center because I should have I should have built a tenon and trued up both sides. There we go. It's close enough. Squeeze it between centers and turn it into a cylinder. There we go. One would turn that to the size diameter of your set or your pieces. Now, my pencil go. So I'm just going to sort of make an indication of where the, the top of the crown would be. Also where the, the lower portion is here. Okay. Um, this design of a knight is proprietary. So just so you know, nobody's going to keep this at home. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I'm going to take my parting tool, just kind of bring down this lower section here. That cut is right here. That section. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, right in here. That's where that cut is. And I'm going to turn it into a cylinder roughly this diameter here. Bring that down, make that a nice straight cylinder. Well, let me grab this tool. spindle gouge and now I'm gonna round over this part in here. Create that rounded shape. I'm gonna chip away at the corner. Okay, you can watch as I sequence. This is more or less a half sphere. Chipping away at that corner a little bit at a time. 
like that. I'm going to bring down the diameter a little further. So here, when you're when you're doing this in repetition, uh, you want to be more careful about when you where you determine your off center point. Because we're doing four of these, ideally every chest will have four knights. Um, I would be more articulate about identifying my next procedure to determine where the off center would be. And to do that, I would probably I would pull off the side and maybe shift it about a quarter of an inch or a half an inch. Uh, but I would indicate it a little more. Oh, actually, I think I might have used this kind of trick once before. You see how this ring, there's a ring right around there? It's another measuring tool. All right? Use that as your measuring tool. Why well, get out the calipers and a little something or other when you got it right there? So I could either put the pin, the center, right along that line, or I could put, the, if you look at this pin, there's also a ring around there. I want to go a little further. I can put the outside of this ring on that line. So you got a couple options. How much off center you want to go? Little tricks like these can just be, uh, you know, save you a little bit of time and just make things move a little smoother. So I'm going to kick it off center, some random location. Just kick it right back there, and you'll see how it's going to spin now. All right, pinch it in some. Right about there. That looks good, right? Everybody, that looks all right. All right, I'm gonna cheat this tool rest in a bit. Small projects like this as well. Uh, your tool rest, having a shorter one, can be advantageous because we sometimes in my power Mac the same deal. We got a really nice, wonderful tool rest. Sometimes it just hits the sides when you're trying to tighten things. So I did purchase a six-inch tool rest that fits right in there and kind of move it around a little more. So what I would do is come in, um, probably make a little quick measurement here. Again, a story stick could be helpful for this moment. You could hold that piece of wood up here and just kind of identify where that, that location would be. I'm going to spin this around just to make a line. It's going to be out of whack. But you'll see there it goes. All right. Now basically what I'm going to do is cut this part right here, this off-center part, I don't know if you see that, yeah. I'm gonna cut that side. Just trim that down a bit. Notice I slowed it down a little. I'm a little nervous here at this thing, knuckle busters here, okay? Just coming with my parting tool. Cut that down some. You can see how that is, right? A little off center. Then I'm going to come through and sort of, I'm going to carve this shape here, this cylinder part that's off center, because that whole section is off center. Kind of gives it a little tilt, a little bit of a lean, very subtle. Um, talk a little bit about how to use your tool. Notice I'm using it almost like an arc, right? One thing that you can do is very useful for turning things like this that are uh, off center or when you're roughing out a bowl. You know how sometimes like tick, 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 because the thing's not round and your, your tool's chattering all over the place. I call it a, a pivot cut where I hold the tool in one spot and then I pivot in that section. Okay, because it takes those repeated boom, space, boom, space, boom, space, very well because I'm not moving the tool very much. I'm very anchored down with the tool and those repetitive hits are good. When I try to move the tool sideways and I'm hitting those repeated cuts, that move motion is going to get emphasized every hit. It's going to kick it. I'm going to have to slow it down. So watch as I'm doing this. I'm more or less doing a pivot. The tool is anchored and my hand is anchored in one location. 
and that allows me to stabilize the tool, do repetitive cuts relatively quickly without, with, with achieving a decent surface. And also a pivot, if you're doing a cove like I'm doing here, that will, a pivot gives you a radius, which is another challenging thing to do. You know, I'm not looking for a taper. I want a radius. So if I fix my tool at one point and I pivot, it creates a curve. Okay? Now you can utilize that concept in a few different ways by pushing deeper into the cut or maybe moving slightly one to one side to make maybe a tangent curve. Um, so that pivot idea is something I find very useful. Now I'm gonna bring this down right until that center cylinder I have contact all the way around, still off center. Let's see here. Oop, I hit the edge a little bit. Don't cut uphill. <laughs> I see, you can, you, can you see that there? I don't know if it shows up too well right here. So my tool hit this open part, ripped that uh, stuff right off. So, and you see Eggly, put that back in there and don't even tell a soul. I mean, it has a clue. So I got that little uh, scoop in there, right in right where my pinky is. I have contact all the way around. Um, and I can d decide, I can kind of stop and look if I want to change it some. But this is kind of a fun little swoop in there. I'm going to carve it just a tad more right now. Come right in nice and easy. Notice the angle that my, I'm standing here. Get the tip of my tool up in there without hitting the edge like I did on accident the previous time. I'm a little over here, it won't work. So I'm just creating that scoop. Dive it right up in there. Now here's actually one place where a skew could be quite useful to do a nice slicing cut to get a good 90 degree angle there at that uneven spot. So I, I would probably transition to that tool, but I'll use my spindle gouge. Coming in good and steep here. To clean that up. Now ideally, you know, you can start sanding with something like 9,000 grit or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Um, at this point, if one were to uh, be uh, moving along uh, for a final piece, I would sand it. Okay, I would sand that off center section, just hold some sandpaper there real quick. Touch that up, and also this under the underbelly here of the, the head portion, you can sand that right now too. Because that's the last time it'll be at this um, center. Then what I'm gonna do is bounce this back to my original center. Get it, don't create it too tight because you can sometimes tweak it in that grip or maybe uh, squish it so it might break. You don't want this to get too terribly skinny down there. Of course, the integrity of the piece it might compromise, it might break. So you can see now that center portion is floppy all around right here. It's kind of fun to put your finger on there and just feel a jiggle. Um, now I'm just gonna sort of trim up now. Um, I'm gonna hit uh, this lower section right here. All right, that's gonna be right there. And then I'm gonna also cut up this upper part where the crown, the head would be up in this section. Now I do, ha I have extra material here. We call it waste material. But in the end, it will go away. And that's more important with, your, with this design of a knight because I do need to do it between centers. Um, it makes it a little trickier because you can't get at this uh, uh, freehand like you can with the chuck, the screw chuck. I suppose if one wanted to right now, um, I could have drilled the hole and put this back on the lathe uh, to hold it at this point, do the off center at a different, with, you know, between centers and then put it on that screw chuck. That is an option. I'm going to come back now. I'm going to keep an eye out for where that transition is going to occur. So my, my off-center swoop comes up to this point, and I kind of like it right there. So I want to try to, at that juncture, curve it down, do a half a bead, try to, try to get it dialed in right to that location. It down nice and tight. I realize I need to come back over here now after that couple cuts to sort of ease this curve in there a little more. Just to punch it in there a little bit like that. 
And that looks pretty dynamite if I say so myself. If I critique my own work, everything would be perfect, right? Um, so there, that's off center. Now I'm going to hit the, the crown up on the top, and we'll see how that goes. Get all, all different kinds of shapes here that you could consider making uh, with this off center. It's very simple off center. You could do more of a angular curve for the crown. I kind of like the rounded shape a little bit. Um, just what I gravitated towards. At this point, potentially sand it and be, and be set with there. Um, you could put your finish on as well at this stage. I still do have this upper part here, this waste material. To get rid of that, bring it down nice and tight. When I part things off from the lathe, you want to get, um, you got to be careful so you don't pull out those fibers, right? I don't know if everybody has that issue, cut things off the lathe sometimes. Fibers rip down low. One of the critical things, and it's a super simple thing to do, is what I did. Uh, yeah, I guess you can see it in there. I remove a lot of material sort of over here. Okay, I, I make it into a cone. I want a nice triangular cone so that the low right in here is really tight, but it, it spreads out far. I don't want too much material right here to make it difficult for my tool to get in. You want that accessibility. So remove a lot of material, kind of spread it back a little bit. With this sample, it's not too critical because it's a small piece, but if one were doing a larger project, uh, sometimes uh, finishing the bottom of a hollow form, you get a, little, a, a lot of material. Use that concept of a cone, um, and that can be very useful for when it comes time to part it off. You can see I'm getting a little smaller here. And even to be more safe, leave a little material on your piece. You want to be more careful, uh, and then later on, remove it with the hand chisel. Provided it's not dull from using it in the garden. Sorry. And then you part it off as such. Um, and maybe hit this with a little bit of sandpaper, just to kind of polish that off. But that's a quick little tutorial on how I would do that off-center turning. And it throws, and it makes it just unique enough to people know what it is. You don't have to sit here and hand carve for very long. Um, some of us just don't have those skills. Uh, that's for sure. Any thoughts, any, any ideas? Very simple little thing. Yeah, cool, yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just gonna bring those up. So. Yeah, so spindle turning uh, can get a little out of hand sometimes. Um, these are called tremblers. Uh, gentlemen, again, I'll make, bring up his name again, uh, Jean-Francois Escoulin, he's from France. That's where I first ran into this project, uh, just YouTubing or Google or something, and uh, maybe it was AAW, but he had these projects. And it just looked really freaking hard. So I was like, yeah, let's give it a shot. Um, and uh, they're all one piece of wood made out of maple. And the idea here is uh, it's more of a skill building project for me uh, really than anything else. Some folks like he will you know, make these a uh, little more articulate, really nice displays, but I made these. These ones I made probably about 45 years ago. This one I did for a demonstration for our club a couple months back. Beyond these, I really haven't done much. Uh, two of them are short on purpose. <laughs> um, yeah, so sometimes they, yeah, they don't hold up so well. You'll learn as you go. But um, is anybody familiar with these projects? How, how, does anybody know what a string steady is? String? A little bit about that, yeah? Because a string steady is essential for this. Everybody knows what, a, what a, a spindle steady rest is, right? It's a little wheels, and you got your long spindle, and those wheels help support the cut. 
Well, a string steady um, makes these possible because as you get thin like this, the wood will whip as that whipping action. And a string steady, a string steady pinches your material between string uh, with a certain contraction, and then you pull it really taut, and the string rides the wood and reduces that uh, vibration to nothing. And such that what I do is you can actually have your four jaw chuck here holding a, a large piece of wood, and this end should be spinning free. You don't even need the tailstock at some point because those string sticks. Sorry. Um, and with the four jaw chuck here, you have your grip, and then you you progress uh, down a little further. So as they sit on the lathe, let me just move these over. You start, um, I start with a perfectly, uh, a nice square piece of wood that'll fit in, and I'll have, I will initially turn it, I think this was eight quarter stock, kiln dried wood, you can use green wood, might even be more forgiving, because that wood is a little more flexible. But um, build a, a four jaw chuck with a gripper on the end, uh, a tenon, so you can squeeze that in there. Pull up your tail stock on this side and you line it up. It's just one long cylinder. Turn it round right from the start. And then you proceed through your cuts up at the rim. You move in succession on your way down closer to the chuck. And you go as daringly thin as you want. Um, I only went that far, which I don't know quite how daringly thin that is. But I'll carve this section and I'll move down. And then all of a sudden I'll notice this part here will start to sort of flop around in the wind. And that's when you turn your lathe off and you kind of go, whoa. And then uh, you set up your first uh, string steady. You have a succession of four to five of them. I should have brought one just so I could show you. Yeah, I was just about to draw. So imagine, um, uh, yeah, let's do that. So think about a Pac-Man, all right? Um, like a big open sea, okay? Come like this. And there's a base unit that comes down. This, so I have a Powermatic as well. And this base unit, there are some critical dimensions when you're designing your, your string steadies. So I made it so that this unit is exactly the same width as this here. So whenever I set one up, I can find exactly where it needs to be by aligning the wood critically to the width. Because what's important is the very center of this, this is plywood, by the way. Um, um, this right around here, I think it's like half-inch plywood. Do something really good and strong. You want to design it so that the very center of this curve is in the middle. Then you set up four screws. One here, one here, one here, and one over here. These need to be in perfect alignment with each other. These two and these two, this one up there, and this need to be perfect alignment with each other, with this being the center. Very important. So setting. You should, yeah. Exactly. This open cavity doesn't need to be perfect, it could be square, whatever you like. It is critical, most importantly, for your four screws to be identified. And they're short screws, half inch. I just screw them in so that the head of the screw is actually sticking out a little bit. So what I'll do then is I'll, uh, once I align this, this is also aligned so that the center is in the center of my base. So when I hold it here, all of this centering is dialed in right in the center. Perfect. So then what you do, um, you take a piece of string when it becomes relevant. Oh, mind you, the piece of wood is sticking like this. Okay? So that C is like here. All right? Does that make sense? And the reason why you have this open cavity is so that when you later on put one on the machine, uh, you can slide this, you know, through there and get it on. Um, so you'll have this big C, and this is sticking through. And you will initially you do it, and when you get a long slender part like this, that's when you start to get your whipping. And it'll start to really vibrate and you'll just see that. 
So you take your string and you uh, take one, you sort of tie it up here, wrap it around, come down like that. And then with the same piece of string, you'll come up over here, come down on that side, come around, back up here. Okay, so here's the center. So your string wraps on both sides and, and creates that sort of X pattern. And as you do so, you'll want to pull it nice and tight. And because you use these screws, um, there will be a little bit of a gap between your string. Okay? That's what you want, just a little bit of a gap. You don't want necessarily that string to wrap around your wood here, okay? You just want it to kind of brush up against the sides. Use a nylon string or something that won't burn. Because <laughs> I found out that string can like, you know, it wore down and it snapped on me, this one string I had. So you gotta use something that's resistant to heat because it will generate heat on your project. Um, and so then that slides through. Basically, your, as your piece is coming out like this, that will pinch this nice and tight, and it'll, it'll stop it from whipping. It won't flop around anymore. Right? right, that could be a good idea. Right. That would work. I think also what I might have done on one of these is that diameter is too large. Um, you might even consider crossing it so that this side starts up here and then maybe comes down over here and then over here and it comes up and around. You can cross it. Uh, that will encourage it to hold it tight as well. Uh, but that is not very structurally strong. You know, I wouldn't use that as one would use a, a bowl steady or a or a spindle steady. You don't want to put any pressure on that and rely on it. Because all it does is when this thing is moving around, it just steadies this uh, thin section enough to just keep it. Because what that whipping action will just get out of control and just snap. Fast as you like. Just keep going. Turn it up. Um, you will realize sometimes, though, uh, it might some uh, the harmonics of your machine could change at certain rates. So if you find that it's going too fast and that whipping, sometimes you turn, dial it down, change the harmonics a little bit, and then that'll ease that whipping some. But um, nothing is really as good as the string steady. Uh, but you can go pretty quick. You know, try to go a couple thousand RPMs because when you're doing this. You want to get a nice clean cut. So what I would do is, for instance, uh, I would carve all of this, still with the tailstock up in my little pinhole, and then I'll sand it, completely sand it. If I were to concern myself about finishing it, I would probably do it at that time as well. This piece I did not. I carved it down, then I uh, would have sanded that, and I would carve this little section. Maybe get to about here, and all of a sudden this thing's starting to show some whipping vibration. It looks like that off-center turning but it's not. <laughs> um, and at that stage, I would set up my first string steady right about here. And I would progress down through here, carving, and I, I freeform these, that's kind of my style. Uh, if I, uh, I sometimes compare wood turners to uh, music, because I like music a lot. I'm more like, uh, I freeform, I just riff, you know, I make stuff up as I go along. Some people compose music, I don't compose music, so I just kind of make it up as I go along. And I just sort of come up with some shapes. And you get down to this section, maybe it starts to whip again in this little area. So you set up another string steady. So I'll have this, I'll have a big contraption here, another one here. As you get further down, you might need another one. And so you're finding your workspace is getting a little more congested, a little bit tighter. So then you'll just need maybe a move your tool rest. That's why you work in succession when you're doing this long project. Boom, 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 come your way down this way. Get closer to your tailstock or your headstock where you got that grip, good sturdy grip on there uh, to the point where you can then accidentally break it and then uh, be just fine. Now, this one actually, interesting thing, this one broke while I was sanding it. Um, there was probably another four inches on it. But the transition, I applied sandpaper to this ball here and it, the resistance of the paper slowed this section down enough while this part still was torqued in the lathe and it just twisted off. 
So there's there's a little lesson for you. Don't apply too much pressure beyond a thin section. Um, these other ones that did split here, um, this one, I this one I sort of repaired a little bit. I drilled a hole and just put an old drill bit in there. I uh, just upright it. But if this one broke because I had, when you have transitions from one feature to another, let's see how you. Um, yeah, this one here. You want them, they're, they're strongest if they are not sharp transitions. Like that tight transition in there, comes straight down 90 degree, not very sturdy when you get thin, right? It's going to want to break the cantilever quite a bit. You get a radius, you spread out that pressure some along that curve, and you're more likely to have success. So I, uh, the ones that work generally have a little bit more of a curve when your features, uh, less chance of it wanting to snap on you. Like the one that broke, it was a really tight 90 degree transition. You don't have that structural integrity to hold it up. Um, and then you just have fun with them. They are, they, they take a while. Yeah. Correct, yep. So what he's referencing is, so these are pretty much turned kind of one-handed. Um, I use my, my spindle gouge exclusively. Um, and I, what I'll do, I'll have my hand here, the stick coming through. And if I'm working, and I turn that stick into a cylinder, so that when I put my hand, wrap my hand around the cylinder, it's nice and easy, not rocky as if it were rough still in the rectangle. Um, and I will hold my hand here, just as such, and if I'm working on this ball right here, I would have my hand and I'll use my thumb as a, as a stop. I move all my tooling with my right hand like this and carve it. All right, so it's sort of one-handed turning. And that's where riding the bevel becomes really critical because I can stabilize the tool by riding the bevel and maintaining contact with the wood uh, even when I'm not cutting. I'll just like I was talking earlier, keep the tool on the wood, even if your cutting edge is not cutting, if you can stabilize your material and balance it better. But yeah, the, I will get some side pressure. Sometimes I might even, I think I may even have a, a traditional uh, steady rest with the wheels, maybe halfway through to help stabilize that until I get closer. But stabilizing it is a tricky thing. Yeah, excuse me, yeah. No, I've, oh, I thought you were joking. No, no, totally not. Finials. Sure, sure. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. So the, with the French, the French are really amazing wood turners. And if you, if you want to try to find some really progressive, really, you know, traditional techniques, yeah. <laughs> Um, they really, uh, they they really take wood turning to a level that you're just kind of like, why? You know, uh, it's more just creativity uh, and experience, and I think you know just the ability. So they have competitions. I don't know Francois does where he'll just have trembler competitions. Guys get together. How long can you go? Well, my lathe is only 32 inches, so that's it. And you literally you see them stacked up like 15 string steadies, and they're there for like three hours and. And what they'll do is to get them off of the lathe because they make them much thinner than I. I mean, there's not much more to go, but imagine even thinner, or even these thin sections being longer. They'll take them off of the lathe, like four guys, you know, and it weighs like an ounce. Right, and then they have, they have glass tubes, basically like a, a beaker or something. It's a big glass tube, and they'll slide it over the top. And forever, forever it remains. The cap, the bottom, you know, um, and that's about it. Uh, and that's the only presentation that I've really seen. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a skill building thing. It's kind of like that's why I did it. I hadn't seen. I've never seen one uh, by another person. I've only seen these ones, just because it is a tricky thing. And why would anybody really want to do it? Uh, give yourself a Tuesday afternoon, and you're bored. Uh, but try it out. It's it's really more you know advanced spindle turning. You can do that in spindle turning class two. Um, but yeah, spindle turning. It's fun.
Cool. I think that's all I have for the moment. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, I don't know what else to do. Anybody wants to chat or for coffee?